everybody. Sticking with the theme of bracing for a new reality, this is, of course, a digital world that we live in. And it's not a surprise uh, to anyone to hear me say that the way we consume content has really changed a lot over the last decade and is, is, is poised to continue doing so with the advent of artificial intelligence. So on this panel, we're going to talk about digital disruption in content and media distribution, uh, but also how we can introduce guidelines to keep innovation alive, but at the same time protect consumers. And then, of course, the big buzzword this, these days is artificial intelligence and what that means as well for digital disruption in the context of media. So let's start uh, with the panel. Uh, Daria, I would love to start with you, uh, given that you, uh, the president of a platform that operates amongst, and I believe the figure is correct, 11 million households in yes. Latin America. So you are in a unique position to talk about just purely the digital transformation that your industry has witnessed over the course of the last decade and is continuing to see disruption. So my question to you is, in an age of increasing competition, what do you do not just to attract the audience, but to retain the audience? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everybody. Thank you for Bloomberg for giving me this opportunity. In answering your questions, we have a digital dilemma, which is, in simple words, nobody has to be left behind. We have, because of figures of the World Bank, about 2.6 billion people who are not connected to the internet, and in Latin America alone, about 220 million people. So, this brings us to how do we include all these people to the digital era? And the inclusion will bring a lot of transformation in the people's life, their education, their health system, banking, their entertainment. Companies, companies will, will have new companies appear. We have some companies that will disappear throughout time. We have the influence in the countries within the boundaries, because as you know, the digital information has no boundaries. It goes to one place to the next without limits. And it will change societies, the way we connect to each other, the way we talk, and we've seen this in the young people. So, Digital inclusion is much more than connectivity. Connectivity is only one part of it. But what do we need for digital inclusion to include? We need a very new regulatory framework, flexible, updated. As you know today, telecommunications, digital platforms, and audiovisual blurred, giving rise to a new complex and ever-changing ecosystem that enables a lot of interactions that, that are unimaginable, mm -hmm. and we haven't had that for the last 10 years. So everything is changing a lot. So we have to be, we have to level the playing field taxis, regulatory, for everybody to play in the same uh, battlefield, if you want to call it. Mm. Also, we need to have public policies to build digital skills for all the population. Because uh, entering the digital area is not easy. And we have to have conditions to enable to the digital infrastructure. In order to have digital infrastructure, we need to promote the public and private sector very strongly. It's impossible to do it the private sector alone, but we need to partner with the public sector and do it as a policy of national policy of each country to really digitalize their population. I want to give you a couple of examples that we do basically in Latin America. We have a couple of programs that they are called Escuela Plus, 
where we give connectivity through video to the different schools all around Latin America. We have around 10,000 schools connected. Mm -hmm. And what we do is teachers training and classrooms to the students. But we don't have it in the cities. Obviously, these schools are scattered around Latin America in very remote places. Yeah. And it's really amazing the effect that they have in the teachers and the students. Mm -hmm. For example, one teacher, when I was visiting the, one of the schools, told me that he teaches, uses all these tools to teach his kids. Right. And in order to make a grade for these kids, he asked them to make a video. Mm -hmm. So the kids in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of the mountains, have yeah. this opportunity. Let me... Yeah. Two more mm -hmm. things and I'll finish. <laughs> and, I'll give, and I'll pass it on to you. Another interesting, interesting story is about in the Amazon. In the Amazon, we have a school, a school sustainable, sustainable school, and we talked with the different people of the village of the school, and we talk about the digital area coming with the internet, the video, and everything, and they were very enthusiastic because of all the possibilities. But one of them told me something that made me think about it, which is, I will be able to teach my culture. He was a native in the Amazon teach my culture, teach the world how do I take care of our earth, how do I do the medicine, and how do I work with the land in a way, in a sustainable way for our product. So it is very important not only to have connectivity going downwards, but to collect the different cultures, the different uh, initiative yeah. that the people have all over the world and really learn from each other in order to create yeah. a, a, new, mm -hmm. a new world. And let me give you one more, one more concept that I think is very important, which means, which is that in order to have this old technology of this technology going forward very powerful, it needs digital literacy. What is the meaning of digital literacy? It's educating to face hate speeches, hate speeches, yeah. to educate against racism, to educate against gender discrimination, and to educate, educate against antisemitism. The world in, of the future has to be built on solid values that we have to yeah. really take over it. In the past, we fought and we are fighting today wars for land, for resources, yeah. for different, for eliminating people. Everybody can remember yeah. the Holocaust and <laughs> the digital <laughs> inclusion yeah. should I'm carry the flag, should carry absolutely. the flag of the development and should be another way to promote peace in okay. the world. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry. articulated the I'm case sorry. for digital inclusion very well and digital connectivity, uh, which uh, leads me nicely perhaps to uh, our next panelist. Uh, you are in a unique position because you've seen the transition of the world away from desktop to mobile and now increasingly towards AI. How do you think AI is going to disrupt the way we consume media? Uh, Jumana, first, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. I see a lot of illustrious people in the room. Yeah, speaking about AI, I think AI has the, po the, the, the power to be another catalyst of efficiency in the, in the society. We live the, through democratization of access. You spoke to him about uh, media democratization. Some people call it fragmentation, but in reality, we democratize media to not only uh, you can watch anything anywhere with the right guidelines in respect to intellectual property, but also have a new universe of the creative economy with the creators. So that's the second part. And later, recently, we saw in the last 10 years, democratization of the ability to, to be an entrepreneur. Uh, Google in Brazil, we have been around 20 years in Brazil, and we, we have accelerated in a startup campus here about 450 companies. So that means power to the people. 
And we think that AI, to answer your question, has the power to help everyone. We see three types of AI. AI for the businesses to increase revenues, and we have that already pretty much in the market. We have Brazilian companies and companies all, all around the world using artificial intelligence to do better revenue generating programs uh, that through agents, through uh, voice ordering, through better media. And that brings the second bucket of opportunities, which is about uh, becoming more efficient. Becoming more efficient, it means that you use technology, you use AI to really find the right audiences, to have the right programs, and effectively to, to use less money to achieve more people and to engage with more people. And then the third part of it is about AI for innovation, where we see so many solutions that help to address social problems, economic problems, climate changing problems, uh, and we have uh, examples and examples of this. So I, I think most of the companies today are engaging with AI in the right way. Brazilians especially are very optimistic about it. 74% of Brazilians believe uh, AI is something that's for good, and we see that that can be something that will help also to bring those that are less favored in the society. Mm -hmm. By using AI, they can become professionals more empowered. Mm. What about the flip side? Uh, what does AI do to creativity? You're, 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 you're in a unique perspective where you can talk about that particular industry. There are valid concerns that AI would eventually replace people's jobs, and also valid concerns about intellectual property, data protection. How do you think about it in the context of, of creativity and advertising? You know, Fabio Coelho is one of my best friends. He's my neighbor. <laughs> but I'm going to take, give you another perspective of what he's saying. Uh, four years ago, uh, my, my wife was celebrating her birthday in Bahia. And people, in the, it was a beautiful party, you know, Caetano playing and she whatever. And somebody in the press started to say that it was a slave party. Slave party. What happened? It was spread in the content platforms, okay? And my wife had to uh, renounce from her job. She had to quit her job. So we went to the public ministry, and the public ministry said this is a lie, but her name was all over. Then I went to Fabio. Said, Fabio, this is a lie, the public ministry has proved, so please take that from that. He said, I can't, I can't do that. It's because of him? No, it's because of the laws mm -hmm. of Google. Mm -hmm. But, and you don't know what happened to our, com our family about that. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll so, talk about just a second, yeah. please, because he had all the time. No, no, of course. Uh, <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> my fault. My no, fault. no, no, he had all the time. So what I'm saying is this, you know, first of all, if Google is in Brazil, mm. they need somebody that can say, no, this is act. It cannot be ruled from outside. Fabio is, well, Fabio is a, 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 a blessing for Brazil. He's a very serious guy. But what the problem about these platforms is that all their, their speech and their rhetoric is very cute. All of them has, want to change the world. Then Bezos buy a boat of $500 million. A guy that buy a boat for $500 million hates the world and hates the sea. Right? I'm, I'm from absolutely capitalist, but there must yeah. be frameworks. Th that's what I'm saying. So we'll talk because, about the for example, they are in, ca in California. Yeah. They, they are having problems, and the governor of California is very connected to the, the main platforms. And then they don't want to pay press rights, content rights, all these kinds of things. So uh, artificial intelligence for us, for the rich, for the businessman is fantastic. But we have to understand that they, like anybody else, my wife says that I need frameworks. 
<laughs> so everybody should have, must have brainworks. Yeah. And this has nothing to do with him, but it has to be to the governance of that, okay. which I think is very Can important. I bring it back to my original question, which was simply how artificial intelligence you think is also disrupting creativity and the way content is actually created. We, we've talked about the framework, of course. No, yeah. I know, but since mm -hmm. the name of the panel is The Dilemma, I'm yeah. talking dilemma. about that, right? Because they talk about the possibilities. Um, of course, it's going to be fantastic. For example, uh, I sold my agency. Uh, I had an uh, uh, advertising group, and now I have a small, huge company because of all the environment that these things brings to us, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, so I, I don't need uh, to have, I had uh, about 2,500 people suing me because of the labor laws in Brazil. Now I have something very small and I pr I'm probably one of the most profitable companies and, uh, and only with 10 people. That's fantastic, but that's also a problem. So I'm putting myself in the same situation, right? So of course it's going to be, for example, for Brazilian advertising is amazing because we never could compete in the same level as the international because we didn't have the same uh, tools in the production. So now we, are com we have our local creativity, but we can produce in the global standards. Mm. Gary, let me come back to you. Um, yes. And uh, just bring it back to what the gentlemen were talking about, having the right framework in place, and whether too much regulatory oversight can actually stifle the industry. And at the same time, whether it's your perception that the regulators have um, somewhat of a, a, a a holistic view to the industry, but in certain cases can carve out exceptions. Yes, I think it's the regulators have an old view of the industry. The industry has moved uh, forward very quickly and we had to adjust, and as I said before, level the playing field. But one thing that is super important, it's uh, piracy. <laughs> uh, maybe nobody talks about piracy that much, but piracy, in Latin America is about 40% of the market, which is huge. And need, this needs to be addressed by the governments, by the companies, by the public, educating the public not to do it, the companies to fight it, and the governments to give us the framework to be able to, when we detect the piracy, really attack and try to move it to the legal side, let's call it. And I think that's one of the most important issues that the regulators need to, to think about and to really address. Mm. Well, regulators are turning their sights increasingly towards the big tech platforms uh, because of concerns about what happens on these platforms, the spread of disinformation, whether there's enough guardrails in place, consumer protection. I just wonder whether you think from your standpoint and from the regulators that you have dealt with, whether enough is being done to protect the consumer, like Nadine uh, and, and others, and uh, whether it, the regulation is sufficient enough to keep a level playing field. Well, it depends on the area. But first, let me allude back to Nizan's point here. First, his wife is a lady, is a great person. <laughs> I cannot remove content. It's not about me, mm. it's about her. So that's one of the it problems, you know. No, it's about they cannot remove hate. It, 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 allow me, allow me to. Okay, to I will. It, it's about following the law. I told him to get an injunction, and then of course he would take that into consideration. If that's not exactly defined as a crime of hate, mm. racist. Uh, but that was a problem, Fabio. Uh, I'm sorry, but you are lying. Yeah. <laughs> that was a problem. My right. my my wife spent four years yeah. trying to prove something <laughs> that yeah. the minister, the public ministry, said and proved, and I sent to you. I and it's not about yeah. you, but it's uh, hate is not content. You cannot put that on television. Yeah. You cannot put that on the press. So you guys should not be uh, uh, obeyed by another kind of rules. There's the law. You know what's a framework? Michael Bloomberg is a framework. 
You will never do something that he doesn't think that's right. So I'm sorry. I, I think I'm, I, I'm not being very kind to you, but you are not very kind at all to me, to my wife, and to the democracy. Now, allow me to continue. Uh, what I see here, Mr. Sudani, speaking about regulation, of course, regulation is necessary. Brazil has uh, something called Marco Civil, which is equivalent to GDPR, which is the internet framework, has 10 years now. It is from uh, April, May 20, uh, 2013, 2014. What we see here now with the advent of AI is that there is an opportunity to work with AI for regulation. And we see that that's something that needs to be discussed with the society, with the politicians, with the companies, and with all the people that are using AI at the moment. I think it's important that we have that discussion, yes. Mm. When it comes to copyright infringements, plagiarism as well, this is another aspect. You know, the, the, the whole bunch of potential well, bottlenecks that you talk about, but of course this is one of the risks too. We, we have uh, 185 agreements with media companies in Brazil mm -hmm. to use their content mm -hmm. and to, and that content, those, co those agreements exist from the large media companies to the small ones. Mm -hmm. Also, companies that do not not want to have their content published on Google, they can access and have that, that content removed on Google, on YouTube. Of course, this means that we have, one, agreements in place. It's important to have partnerships signed. Second, it's important that we do not, I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire industry. I'm speaking here on behalf of Google and its platforms. Third, discussion of copyright in the AI, in the AI moment, this is actually happening as we speak. We have agreements with the, some companies to use their content to, to train our models. This is something that's happening for the last uh, year and a half. Well, Mizan, uh, you've been very articulate. Yep, go ahead. It's, it's good to have a disagreement between ourselves and to see that we really need boundaries in order to be able to come up with a consensus on how do we have to behave with the, in the digital scenario. Uh, this is a typical problem that we have every day. Yeah. And this is fantastic to have it in real time. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah. Lisa, so this so is real time. But let me bring it back because you seem pretty critical of the way the, the regulation is, I guess, put in place, but also the way it's executed. What is your recommendation then for what the regulator should allow no, and should not you allow? Need for? regulation, absolutely. Yeah, it's critical to have regulation. The problem is that it should not be a regulation done by people who don't understand what they do and all the amazing things that they do. That's not the point. Mm. You know, I, I'm what I'm just giving is another perspective. Regulation should be done especially in copyrights, uh, for example, in Brazil, if uh, uh, an, an advertising ad is a content, but we take it out from television in 24 hours, 24 hours, and we did this regulation. So this kind of framework, because it has nothing to do with value. It has to do with the far west that became the platforms. Anybody can do anything. Okay, so there it needs a regulation. We cannot, uh, it cannot be done on uh, harming them in, their in the core of their business. It's simply to have professional, modern, but at the same time, um, uh, decent and, res the word is responsible, mm -hmm. that's it. So then that raises an because it's a business, it, but right? Then it becomes an ethical question because the debate, and over here in Brazil, because recently there was an episode with the uh, with the Elon Musk platform, mm -hmm. with the regulator over here, and it became a whole discussion about free speech versus censorship. So, at what point do you draw the line between the two? Well, I don't know. I don't know what's what's that. What I can see is the effects. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I'm not, uh, I, I, I cannot understand clearly. That's what the, the great dilemma on digital and the great dilemma in democracy. We are trying to rule things that are more complicated. The harm is clear. The benefit is clear. But the collateral things that can happen in this, uh, in this breaches, right, in, the, in this framework is also visible because never the work was more inequality, divisive. You're seeing the United States. The United States so is, is so crucial. The democracy in the United States, the election is a global election. It's important for us, you know? And so it's, it's, it needs necessary. It's not exactly, uh, I think the solution here that happened with Elon Musk, I'm not clear that it was not distorted in the heat of the discussion, right? I think it's important that it was done. I think it was fair, it needed, but we have to have a less emotional, and as you can see, there's a lot of emotion. <laughs> there is, there is. Dario, let me just ask you whether you think, uh, look, for me, it just feels like the train has left the station anyway. No matter what we do, the digital disruption is happening, the world is moving towards AI. So given the heated discussion that we've just had now, what, what can the regulator do to both allow for this innovation but come back to the primary concern, which is protecting consumers? We have to have a big discussions in terms of uh, <coughs> the companies, the providers, the governments in order where is the limit between the privacy and the public opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's a limit that is not very well defined, but it has to be defined. If you go, if you go to sports sometimes, mm -hmm. which is not the case of what happened to you, obviously, but for example, we show a lot of sports that we have the exclusive rights in Latin America. So a big platform is, was not Google, don't worry. Uh, we have a pirate that was broadcasting the game, which was a super game in the Copa America. It say it was like four million people. So we call this huge platform and said, listen, there's a pirate, we give the address, we get everything we need to act, you need to disconnect it, and don't allow to collect money from it. He said, okay, it will take me about one hour and a half. And I said, in one hour and a half, the game is finished. I mean, there's nothing we can do. So these are the things that need to be worked together. The government needs to work, the companies need to work, and to protect. And I come again with the piracy, which is one of the big issues that we have in this industry as a whole. Mm. Well, to leave on a more positive note, since you mentioned sports and in the context of digital, I know that uh, your company has also recently acquired sports rights. Uh, and it, I, found, I thought it was interesting because what we're seeing is this move from linear, linear into streamers, streamers into linear, and sports is one possible area where that intersection meets, namely because it is content that's not replicable. It's live, and once it happens, it's done. What sort of opportunity do you see there in terms of, again, the content that you're offering on your platform? Well, first, you said rights. So we acquired rights. Mm. It's important to say that because uh, it speaks to copyright, right? We were super happy because we're able to capture an opportunity of changing consumption, media consumption. We see Brazilians watching a lot of uh, media, be that streaming or on-demand media on YouTube. YouTube is actually 18.5% is the largest streaming uh, platform that we have in the country. And we agreed uh, in conjunction with a, a broadcasting company to acquire rights for 38 games of the Brazilian soccer championship next year. This is something that started five years ago when we started scratching the surface of showing sports on YouTube through agreements with the, the Northeastern uh, Cup and then we evolved into the Paulistão, the championship of the state of Sao Paulo. Why I'm saying that? Because as we have today, around 75 million Brazilians that uh, watch connected TV, the hard screen, we are now offering three ways for people to, to watch games, to watch soccer games. One is uh, 
on the, their cell phones, on their computers, and finally, now we're connected TV, which is a big thing. Mm -hmm. So since we, we saw that that model is working for advertisers, is working for users, and it's a way for us to help to fund the ecosystem of sports in Brazil together with TV Globo and with the other, other national TVs, we acquired the right for some games and we think that that's gonna be good for everyone. The more options w w we, we offer and the more we have uh, competition for rights, the better it will be for everyone. But uh, Jumara, let me ask, let me make a final comment here, also on a positive note. For these companies, it's important to not only respect copyright, but also to respect the laws mm -hmm. and to understand the rules of use of platforms. I've been the <coughs> statutory responsible for Google in Brazil for almost 14 years. And of course, this is an area where I see an opportunity for everyone to get educated around the matter. It's a, it's a nascent moment. And uh, emerging technologies, they require people to discuss they require dialogue. What happened in that situation that you were alluding to before was that there was not enough dialogue and there was not uh, a legal statutory responsible name in Brazil and companies cannot operate in a market yeah. without having that type of professional uh, appointed here. Yeah. So I think we are in the middle of a process that should not be so inflammatory. <laughs> that should be a process where people sit at the table, negotiate, talk, listen, understand each other, understand the limits and the boundaries of what is possible, and then we come up with a solution that may be the best possible. Yeah. Exactly why we're having this dialogue now. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you thank very you much. much. <laughs>